the big lie. Ah, Susan, come in and have a seat. I'm afraid I haven't had time to read your paper for myself, so I wonder if you wouldn't mind giving it viva voce. Professor Halligan was an academic of the old school, who affected an avuncular manner, a dress sense of tweed and mothballs, and a dimly lit office piled with musty books. Susan was a nervous, uncertain student, fidgeting in her bright fleecy shirt and faded jeans. Awkwardly, she perched herself on the overstuffed chair facing his, and flushed as she fought and failed to speak. Just the main points. Doesn't matter if they're a bit muddled. We can sort out the details when we've done the groundwork. The professor put on his best reassuring smile and patiently nibbled on a fingernail while she collected her thoughts. For nearly a full minute, she sat with head bowed, eyes closed, pinching the bridge of her nose. He was about to ask if she was all right when abruptly she spoke. For the last four centuries, we've been living in a capitalist economy, and economists have been trying to find out what that is. Malthus, Ricardo, Smith, Marx, Sraffa, Hayek and Friedman, they've all failed. Their numbers just don't add up. They use equations built on unmeasurable quantities like confidence or demand. They pictured money as a fixed quantity of water flowing around a circuit of tanks and pipes with no entropy, or as something that had value only so long as we all behaved as though it did. Governments used to get themselves out of recession by printing new money, and sometimes it worked. They're just magic new cash into existence, and somehow people could use pretend money to buy real things. But now most governments live on debt. They borrow money from each other, or from banks whose only capital comes from future repayment of loans, even when that future doesn't happen. Um, yes, said the professor slowly. The market is certainly very complicated, and there are parts we don't understand. That's not what I mean, though, said Susan, becoming more animated. There's a reason all those great minds failed. They were like theologians trying to explain God's grace. They couldn't define capitalism because... because there's no such thing. The professor smiled. Ah, uh, I think I see what's going on here. You are, remember, a first-year economics student, and if I may add, a very bright and able one. You've reached that stage that most students go through, when you realize that not only were your initial preconceptions flawed, but the better ideas of professional thinkers are also imperfect, so you think maybe no one has the answers. Maybe there are no answers at all. He chuckled. Believe me, I've watched it happen hundreds of times. You're having primal doubts, but they'll pass, and you'll learn to live with the gaps in our knowledge, and hopefully plug a few of them. Susan looked deflated and screwed her eyes shut. No, it's not that. It's something more... obvious. What do you mean? She stared at the floor for long seconds, then suddenly looked up. What is profit? Businesses exist to make it. The whole Western world is based on the idea of making money, but how is it made? What's it made from? The conventional view is that it's a return on investment, but that's just a tautology. The alternative view is that it's surplus value extracted from the workforce by underpayment, but what this value is or how it gets congealed into cash. No one knows. Well, yes. Where do crises come from? The right wing says they're from over-regulation, 
or under regulation or bad regulation. The left says it's overproduction or underproduction, but the figures don't match up. Both sides are saying the system's like a machine that breaks down occasionally if it's not calibrated correctly. But no one knows what parts the machine even has, even though we're the ones who built it. I... Susan faltered and seemed on the verge of tears. Professor Halligan reached out halfway to pat her, then hesitated and withdrew his arm. Look, you're obviously agitated. Why don't you take the rest of the day off, and tomorrow we can resume our excavation of modern capitalism? But there is no capitalism. It's a sham. It's a front for something else. All right, Halligan, I've done what you ask. Everyone thinks I'm on a plane to Chicago, except those who think I'm having a dirty weekend with a call girl. I've doubled back, put down false leads, paid for everything with cash, and left my phone at home. Now suppose you tell me what this is all about. Professor Schmidt sat on the end of the hotel bed, waiting for his former student to take off his coat and start explaining. Nearly a year ago, a student came to me with a thesis. It was... Actually, it was brilliant. She had read all the classic texts, plus dozens of others I had barely heard of, and she'd gone right back to basics. Defining terms like market, commodity, product, trade and price from the ground up. Not with words or pretend algebra with actual quantifiable numbers. It was, yes, it was brilliant. Schmidt's expression didn't change. So you've got a good student. Bully for you. If this is about her having your baby, I won't be impressed. Halligan didn't meet his eyes, but he shook his head. No, it's nothing like that. You see... Schmidt raised his eyebrows as the pause lengthened. Halligan looked up. A month later, she disappeared. I mean, completely. She resigned from the course, left her flat, and it's like she vanished from the face of the earth. But she left something for me. A big box of all her research. And the full version of her thesis. It was... Brilliant, prompted Schmidt sardonically. She had come up with a whole new set of equations to describe everything from the value of land to delayed return in technology investment to the effect on productivity of lunch breaks. She plugged in all the numbers she could find. But the numbers didn't add up. Schmidt snorted. So a student invents a grand new theory, does the arithmetic, and it falls apart. Happens every year. No, I've spent the last ten months looking for where she slipped up. Some ambiguous term, some unwarranted assumption. There weren't any, at least nothing I could find. And that's why I'm here. Either I'm going senile, or this girl's explained the failure of economics as a discipline in a way I'd never even considered. Then I'm afraid, old chap, you probably are losing it. I need you to look at her work. If I'm just a stupid old man, fine. If she's made an obvious mistake and I've got Alzheimer's, You'll see it. If she's right. If she's right, I know you'll tell me too. Schmidt stared at his former pupil. You're really serious, aren't you? This girl's got under your skin. Okay, I'll read her tome. But what are you going to do 
when it turns out to be bunk. Go back to your department or retire out of embarrassment. Neither. I've been told in no uncertain terms that my contract is being terminated. Tenure or no tenure, my career's over, and I'll be lucky to get a pension. My dear chap. It happened a week after I went to a colleague with what I've just told you. Please, just read it. Dr. Baxter looked over her spectacles at the tired face of Professor Schmidt. There's no way we can go public with this, she said. They'll bury us. We'll wind up on some website about crazy conspiracy theories. Schmidt gazed into the middle distance. I know, he said. We thought we were living in a world of markets and corporations, but if we were, they'd all have collapsed decades ago. When you buy your cigarettes from the corner shop, they're impossible. There's not enough labor to make them, and the infrastructure to extract and transport the raw materials would cost more than anyone could pay for the finished product. Schmidt nodded. Baxter continued. The moment money gets printed, its value gets cancelled out by its own future movement. It costs more to make a bar of chocolate than to bail out a bank. Diamonds and gold only have value when they don't have function. Taxes could only work if the government paid the people. It's like we're through the looking glass. Schmidt took up the monotone without looking at his colleague. Inflation, booms, slumps. Investments, futures, stocks and shares. Interest, welfare, pensions, even wages. None of it makes any sense. Everything we've spent our lives telling ourselves must make sense, if only we could figure out how. It's all just a light show, a distraction. But who's projecting the lights? What are they distracting us from? What's really going on? You mean, who would maintain the fiction of a global socioeconomic system for several centuries? Who would pretend to pay us and pretend to take the money back to feed us? I mean, who would have the power or the need? They fell into a long silence, eventually broken by Baxter. Halligan's disappeared. He left me a message. What did it say? It said, we are lab rats. <laughs> 